By way of introduction, I'm John Aldeg. I was the member of parliament for Cloverdale Langley City in the um, over in the lower, lower mainland from 2015 to 2019, so one term. And I'm still politically involved. Um, by uh, outside of politics, I was um, a federal government employee for more than three decades. And I'm currently working for the township of Langley. So all in all, I, I know I don't look this old, but I have 40 years of experience and, uh, of being in government, including um, in politics. I, I've also served um, with Canadian Parents for French at the chapter and branch levels. Um, I um, have been involved for a year or so now with um, BC Yukon branch and have served on the Langley chapter. And the format of the presentation, I thought I'd just run through some thoughts on collecting with local decision makers, doing the who, what, where, when, why, and how with some questions and uh, to follow. So to start with, I, I thought, let's define who we're talking about. So local decision makers, and, and I don't want us to get caught up on just the, the very, um, the, the ones who would normally come to mind. So um, when I think of local decision makers, I'm thinking about some of the obvious ones, school boards, the administration within our schools, so the principals, vice principals, <clears throat> as well as the PACs, um, because um, I think many, uh, if not all school boards in, in uh, BC have PACs. I know our, our Langley one that some of my kids went to in French immersion and um, our high school now that they're in French immersion at some um, have PACs. And, and these are all organizations that can influence things at the very local level. Municipal politicians are also the obvious um, local ones, but I consider the members of the Legislative Assembly, the local representatives in uh, Victoria, <clears throat> as well as the members of Parliament to be your local uh, politicians. And so as I talk, it's going to be all of those that I'm, I'm sort of referring to. And, and I also want to say that you never forget the importance of staff for all of the above. Um, in many cases, the, the staff are the uh, um, almost, well, I would say they are the gatekeepers. Um, to the offices. Um, when I was sitting in the, as the member of parliament, you know, we would have um, often 100, 150, 200 email messages a day. We would have multiple phone calls. We'd have email, um, hard mail coming in, snail mail. And, and so the demands on elected officials times cannot be underestimated. And uh, many times there are staff, both at the local level I had in const my constituency office usually three or four staff, as well as a couple of employees in the Ottawa office. And, and so you often have to go through the staff to get to the elected officials or the administrative um, staff. And so never forget the, uh, the importance of staff when you're looking at any sort of campaign or engagement. I would also say uh, there's non-local decision makers who we can't forget about. And these are often government executives. So um, premier and cabinet or prime minister and cabinet um, your education ministers, your other ministers are important. Um, if you're lucky, that person may be your local representative, but often they're a bit more out of reach. And, uh, and then your provincial and national bureaucrats that often affect the things that we're trying to do at the local level. And, and so you may want to have relationships with all of them. In an organization like Canadian Parents for French, where we have multiple um, sort of strata um, with your local, the uh, provincial, regional, and, uh, and the national, um, there's so obviously some coordination of effort needs to happen. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But this is sort of who I'm talking about in my presentation. When we talk about connecting with local decision makers, I was thinking ultimately, what are we trying to do? And for me, it's all about relationships. Um, when I sat as the member of parliament, there were hundreds of organizations in the constituency that I represented. Um, my riding had about 110 residents um, with that. I'm having about 70,000 voting um, public, members of the public. And with that, hundreds of organizations, many of that I'd never heard of until I got elected. And so they're all vying for the attention of the um, elected officials. And I found that what I really appreciated were those who reached out to me in, uh, when they weren't in times of crises um, to let me know about them and what they were trying to do in our community. Because I think ultimately anyone in elective, in elected office wants to make their community a better place. And, and so it's about really building and nurturing those relationships and creating awareness of your organization. I, I would say that there were times where I would get calls from organizations in crises and asking me to intervene with the minister or the prime minister and, and to talk to provincial colleagues 
And I'd be like, I, I don't know who you are. I've never heard of you before. What's your mandate? And so I would encourage everybody at your, your local level with those local people to make sure that they know the Canadian Parents for French exists, the good work that you do in the community, the kind of advocacy role that you play, so that if and when you need their assistance, they're actually aware of the organization and, uh, and they'll be in much better position to help you with whatever it is that you need their help with. Connecting with local decisions. So where can we have conversations? And um, there's some obvious ones. So in person, um, you can go to the local office or you can, uh, in these COVID times, try and connect virtually. Um, also away from the office, um, I, I, I'll, I'll lay out that when I was home as a member of parliament, I would be in Ottawa 26 weeks per year, so half of the year. And so the 26 weeks that you're home are, are pretty compressed with um, meetings and people wanting to talk to you about issues and, and individual cases from taxation to immigration. And so we often would have um, on my home days meetings that would be usually 10 to, uh, minutes in length and uh, with about five minutes afterwards so that I and my team could kind of make notes on what follow up was needed and then the next person would be in and that would go on for like eight hours of the day just um, and sometimes longer than that and then usually off to events or functions in the evenings and so it's pretty jam-packed and um, if you're wanting to meet with somebody in their office locally um, particularly at the provincial and federal level um, you may only get a very brief amount of time. I, I include here away from office because it was actually really nice from time to time to have somebody reach out to me and say, you know what, can I take John for lunch? Because everybody has to eat. And, um, and that way, you know, you, you can actually get kind of an hour with the person, maybe half an hour, but sometimes a bit of an extended period of time. You don't always have to buy, um, but um, it, it never uh, hurts in getting attention. If you say, you know, I'll, I'll take so-and-so to to lunch if you can set up a lunch meeting um, away from the office and that way you can get a bit more than those really structured office uh, slots that are there. Um, email and phone calls are also important ways of staying in touch, um, particularly when the provincial and, and national people are, are in Victoria or Ottawa. It's still a good way of, of being able to touch base um, with people and, and I would try to uh, structure my schedule um, so that um, I, I would be able to take calls from people at home as a way of staying in touch and, and uh, um, just furthering the accessibility um, to myself of my constituents. Social media is also a really way, good way of, of being um, a, a place where we can have conversations with elected officials and, and other decision makers. Um, I, I note here respectful dialogue and support. Um, as I'm sure everybody can appreciate, there's lots of trolls out there. And um, as an elected official, um, trying to, to get away from that noise and, and really the unproductive dialogue is, is a, uh, uh, takes up a lot of, uh, of the day. And if your organization or you as an individual get to be known as somebody that is willing to enter into respectful dialogue on issues related to your mandate, your organization's mandate, but just in general about the community well-being, it, it does get the attention of, of um, elected officials who rely on social media a lot to get the, um, their messages out. And so I would say that, you know, follow any of the elected officials that you want to have relationships with, um, you know, like their posts if it's appropriate. It's not about, um, you, know, you know, really sucking up, but it's about building that relationship and, and letting them know that you're there to support them and, and you, you actually do, um, as elected officials, start to see those in the community who are engaging with you in a respectful way, and it, it does make a difference. And, um, and you also notice the ones you're going to have to eventually block or, or mute um, because th they take up a lot of time as well. I, I would say events, um, I, I, a lot of evenings and weekends um, when I was home would be taken up with attending events. And so if you're hosting things in your community, invite your local, um, decision makers, uh, elected officials and, and others. Um, but I'd say also make sure that they have a role that they're acknowledged or that they are, are um, uh, you know, getting some sort of, of special attention. There would be times where I would be invited to events and, you know, wouldn't get name recognition, wouldn't get um, a role in any way. And it's like I, I had six events that I was invited to right now. And, and it's not about, you know, just seeking public attention or recognition. But for politicians, that is an important part of the job is being seen as being out in the community and supporting good things. And so if you're inviting somebody there and not even letting the community know that they're there supporting you, it, it um, makes them kind of wonder why they've shown up and, and 
you probably won't get them back again. So I'd say, make sure you invite them, give them a role, give them acknowledgement. And, um, and again, it all helps with that building the relationship. The um, next piece I wanted to touch on is um, when should conversations happen? <clears throat> I, I would say that any organization should be touching base at least annually with their elected officials. And if you're planning any sort of campaign, probably more frequently. If you have newsletters, add your local decision makers to your distribution list so that they're getting the information. The staff will at least see it. And often I would have a reading folder where these types of materials would go into it. So I'd know who was sending things. I'd, I'd often um, you know, scan through and see who was doing what in the community. It's really a good way of staying plugged in. And then as I touched on social media interactions, um, just being there, interacting with people, supporting, liking, sharing, and, uh, and that kind of you know, catches the attention that, hey, here's somebody friendly and, and, and um, that, it helps with that relationship. Also things like letters to the editor. If your um, local law representative has done something good, let them know and do it publicly. And that also gets attention. Um, people often write in when something negative happens and that gets attention as well. But it's the positive ones because they don't happen very often. Those can go a long way in building and furthering that relationship. When you're connecting with your local decision makers, you also have to ask, why are we doing this? And, and it circles back again to building and, and nurturing those relationships because you never know when you're going to need the support of those local um, influencers. And um, you know, it could be cutting of programs or funding. And, and if a decision's being made and all of a sudden that's when you're trying to make the connection with the, uh, the politician and they're going, who are you, what's this about? They're going to be way less effective. But if they know of you and you have these discussions all on an ongoing basis, and then there's a crisis, there's a better chance you're going to actually get in the door, or have them answer the phone or return your call and, uh, and hear the issue and then take up your cause. Um, how do I make sure my issues are clear? This was something that I would find. We would have groups come to Ottawa for lobby weeks or who would come to my office to meet with me. And, and they'd often you know, talk for the 10 minutes. At the end of the 10 minutes, I'd kind of go, oh, okay, you know, why are you here? What do you need from me? And, and you know, it was sometimes not clear, is this an awareness piece? Is there a request? Or there would be like you know, 15 requests. We need you to do this, 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 and this. But recognize that politicians and, and um, even bureaucrats are serving multiple parties. And so the ones that I always really appreciated would come in with a presentation that was really tight, five to seven minutes. And then after that, they've set the context. And then it's like, and this is what I need from you. And it would usually be one thing to three max. If, you, if you're more than that, you're not gonna get the support that you need. Um, you also try to match your request to the jurisdiction's responsibilities. So if you're talking to somebody at the local school board level, it could be about funding for programs or placement of programs within the school district. If you're talking provincially, it could be funding for education or new schools. If it's federal, the federal doesn't tend to get involved in education funding. And so it will be things like official languages and support for minority official language communities in the, in the country. If you're asking a politician to out, intervene outside of their jurisdiction, you better make sure that you have a good reason for that ask and a strong relationship with them. So I would have people coming to me and it's like, you need to go and talk to the school board about this. And it's like, well, you know, again, I don't know who you are. I, I don't know what your issue is. Um, I, I would say on that, also understand the relationships that politicians have. So understand if they're on government or opposition, understand um, you know, at the local level in school boards, are there interpersonal conflicts? Um, I would have people come to me and say, you know, I need you to go to the province and talk about this. And yet if the province had been like in our face about something federally, then it's like, well, why would I go and talk to them? And so it's about understanding those relationships and making sure you're going to the right person and making the right request and, and, um, and, and not going to somebody that, you know, and asking them to deal with a minister who's maybe being really horrible to to them in the media. So it's understanding the relationships that people are up against. Um, other thoughts, uh, just kind of generally, as I prepare to wrap up here, consistency in messaging. Um, I think as a national organization, we need to make sure that we're really clear at all levels of the organization that we're supporting one consistent message. It'll do a ton of damage if somebody at the local level is going to the Minister of Canadian Heritage and the Minister of Education and saying something different than what the, uh, the branch or national is saying. And so, um, you know, making sure that everybody's on the, uh, the same page is really important and making sure that you're communicating with other parts of the organization and any sort of campaigns or strategies. Um, because if you get organizations coming in that are contradicting each other, it becomes really easy 
for the elected official or the decision maker to simply dismiss that organization. It, it then seems to lack credibility and they will move on to other things where um, they will actually see a win that can be made and uh, they'll let the organization fight out their priorities and, and messages internally. So those were some thoughts I had for my very brief mini presentation this morning. And with that, I can stop sharing my screen and go back so I can see people. And I have that we're, um, um, yeah, we should have a couple of minutes left, I think, Rowan, if that's correct. And so happy to take any questions that anyone has or, or any thoughts you want to offer. Hey, John, it's Nancy. Hey, Nancy. Um, I, I wonder if you could just speak very briefly on the difference between uh, lobbying and advocacy. Um, because I know that's something that um, CPFers have to be very aware of um, right. and how much we can do. Yeah, um, federally, mm -hmm. as the realm I know, there are very strict rules about lobbying. And, um, and, and so I think that before anybody goes, you know, sort of into any hardcore um, requests or pushes, have a look at the jurisdiction's lobbying rules. I think, you know, relationships going in and, and having conversations <clears throat> is some um, advocacy. It's when you're starting to get to a hard ask when you're asking for money and, and um, you know, things like that, that you're getting into really um, the lobbying and, and you need to be aware of what the, uh, the regulations or legislation are surrounding that. But I think that that's where when you're not in crisis mode and you're not necessarily pushing, especially on the funding level, that having a relationship is, is a, a good thing to develop. Um, and, and that way, if you do need to, um, you know, push on things in a more formal way, um, you'll have the, the sort of the cooperation and, uh, and, and support of that person. I don't know, Nancy, if that's um, enough or yeah. I, I would, you know, yeah, direct people to, you know, lobbying um, rules um, that it can be found online. Right. No, that's fine. <clears throat> You're absolutely bang on. Well, one of the things I'd also wanted to mention are, are petitions are a really useful tool, at least um, federally and provincially. And in the federal system, I meant to include a link for it, but you can Google it on the, or search on the House of Commons. Um, if you want um, a government response to something, you can start a petition. You have to have a, a member of parliament sponsor it. So again, that's where your relationship locally is good to have and to know what kind of issues they're willing to champion. If you exceed, it's either 500 or 1,000 signatures on a petition, the government is forced to actually table a formal government response in the House of Commons, and that becomes part of the public record. And so if you're going to have a campaign, um, something of importance, getting a, a, a petition out there and then having a table in the House of Commons, again, it's a really good way of, of letting your local representatives, especially if they're going to sponsor the petition, know that this is something that's important to your community, your cause, your organization. John, there was also a question in the chat box, which is what do you suggest if the person you reach out to doesn't share your views on French immersion education or won't help you? Any advice? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, sometimes you'll run into people who won't share or don't share simply because they aren't aware. And, and so I think, again, that's where the relationships come in, the, the, the awareness, the knowledge. And, um, but if it becomes apparent that the person is simply resistant to or, or even opposed to, um, uh, you know, you're probably not going to convince them. Um, that's where the relationship may have to change into more of a holding them to account. And if you can let them know that there are multiple people within their community who support this cause, such as French immersion, um, it can put some pressure on because they, they may need that support for re-election. And, uh, and it may mean going to others within the community or, um, you know, it could be neighboring ridings or things like that, where you find a, an ally or a friend. Um, but uh, I'd say find out where the person stands on the issue that, such as French immersion, um, try to create the awareness. Often, you know, I'd have people come and it's like, is this a, a cause I want to champion? Because I wouldn't be aware of it. It's like, is this something that's, you know, a handful of people or is it dozens or hundreds of people? And, and you know, that as you increase the, the magnitude, then it becomes more important to elected officials. And, uh, and that's where, again, things like petitions and campaigns um, letter writing campaigns are really useful because it, it sends that message that this is important to more than just one person. Um, when you're introducing the organization, letting them know how many members are, are part of it, that builds credibility and understanding as well. Okay. 
Any other questions or thoughts? I have a short question. I don't know if it's, it, if it's going to be a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, because of this COVID, we've got situations that some kids in English classes, they could study online. They had this option. And for French immersion kids, that option wasn't given at all. And if, let's say, in a family or household, you have elder parents, uh, sometimes it's a better decision to keep your child home and you study online. But with French immersion, it's very critical decision because if child doesn't speak regularly in French, it's so fast just to lose all this knowledge. And uh, do you think, is there any chance now to, um, how to say, change the situation? Uh, I understand that CPF made such a good um, movement to have tutoring or high school students, volunteers who can help um, at least some chatting with smaller kids. But I think it's a little bit different than would I expect if I have my child at home. Uh, I would expect teacher, and doesn't matter which province from, actually even from Quebec, it would be even better, let's say, than in BC, because in BC we don't have enough teachers who can study and teach online. So do you think there is a chance to turn it over this situation somehow? You know, yeah, really good question. Really, really timely given all that we're facing. I think that, um, you know, the challenge with COVID is we're so far into it right now. A lot of those decisions have been made. <clears throat> I think that this is where going back to, you know, the point of my presentation is about relationships. And I think it's about having people on board so that when the next crises like COVID hits and there's these decisions being made about how to offer programs that, um, that we're not starting the conversation then. I, I don't know how much we can turn the decisions that have been made now. I think it's still good to have a, a concerted kind of press on, on school boards and, and the province in, in making, um, you know, trying to make French immersion accessible other than just in person. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's almost uh, like, you know, we're, we're so far into this. And I think that um, it, it's going to be challenging to turn the ship for this year, but it's turning our mind into what's that next crisis or challenge that's going to come and let's have those relationships and conversations now so that as we're in the moment, the next time we're not starting from scratch and building the kind of awareness and, and uh, credibility piece. Um, yeah, and, and I think it's also about, you know, how building a, a really um, robust, um, in, in the case of Canadian Parents for French, a really robust um, French language learning environment in the province. And uh, so, you know, what does that look like? And uh, I, I know there are many districts or, um, you know, that don't have French immersion or to the level that they want. And, and so these are the conversations we need to be having now. And, uh, and if it's, you know, if they can't do it because of classroom space or teacher capacity or things, it's like, how do we start getting French into those communities so that um, we can take uh, French learning across the province and across the country? So I think that's, you know, really the value of, of this organization is uh, those are the important conversations that we need to be having and, and we need, really need to be pressing on politicians in a sustained and consistent manner over time um, so that, uh, you know, that we, we don't see the loss of programs that we've seen in many communities. Yeah, great, great question. And I, I think one that's really trying for families, particularly those with younger children um, over, the past, uh, over the past year. And so when you say that some um, districts lost French immersion, so it, it really happens now when like in general, we can see increase in French immersion schools. So it still happens. Yeah, as an example, um, Surrey uh, has um, removed uh, some of their French immersion programs from schools and, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, a, again, as a community, making sure that the elected officials, the school boards know that this is important into our community and holding them to account when they make those kind of decisions. Somebody has posted a, a comment, uh, Catherine from Delta, about secondary students. Um, I, I have two daughters in high school right now in grade 10 and grade 12. And um, yeah, they, they're going to have six weeks of, uh, of um, French this year. And, uh, you know, it's just, um, what's that going to do to their, their growth and, and continued development in French? I'm really concerned about it. 
um, but that's where we've landed. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenging year and that's where organizations like Canadian Parents for French are so critical in, um, in the sort of advocacy uh, awareness piece and uh, if we need to, um, you know, pushing into that more formal lobbying, although there may be issues with funding and, uh, and not being able to go into that. Okay, anything else? Um, Rowan, did you want me to touch on anything else or does anybody else have any questions either verbally or if not, we'll move into the next part of the program. Thanks so much, John. This has been really informative. Um, if anybody has any more questions, John's a great person. Um, we don't often get somebody who's actually been an MP to let us know um, kind of how things work. So now's a great opportunity if anybody has any more issues they want to touch on. Also, um, put uh, my email in uh, the chat. It's just john at johnaldeg.ca. So if anybody has any questions after or at any point into the future, if you have thoughts or questions you want to send to me, um, please send it my way. I'm happy to help.